Well, thank you everyone who, uh, who's joined us today. Thank you to everyone who submitted the work. Um, I've done a, a selection of 16 images, but I think there were, you know, there were quite a few more than that. So it was, it was difficult to choose ones to talk about. The ones that I've chosen aren't the, aren't necessarily the best or most outstanding ones, but they're the most teachable ones that will be interesting to talk about. There'll be a lot that I talk about with these images that applies to others. So if you feel that your images has, haven't been spoken about, there's probably content in here that relates to your images. I'm just not using them as specific examples. Um, the first one I'll be talking about is this one, which is one that I've specifically asked for uh, two photographers to both submit one image. That's Andy Blowers on the left and Saga Coretta on the left. Um, the reason I did this was because it covers an aspect of diptychs, which I didn't cover in yesterday's tutorial, which is the idea of a diptych as a conversation between two photographers. Uh, that means it's, a, it's an excellent collaborative tool when, when you have two or more artists working together, you can see which of your images make sense. So these two show uh, different religious ceremonies on the left happening in Milton Keynes or Luton, I forget, and on the right happening in London. Um, two different religions, but both taking place, you know, in the road with people, a lot of passion, a lot of, you know, demonstration of, of their uh, religious intensity. And I always thought these two would, would work well. The fact that they're from different photographers means that there's a different style in the images, there's different cameras being used. The one on the right's on film, the one on the left is digital. So you have, you know, there's enough aesthetically going on that's different, but there's enough going on in the content that's similar, that these two images make a really great conversation. And that's something to think about if you, you know, if you ever find an artist who has work that you really, you know, that there's something about their work and something about your work that kind of fits together, reach out to them, see if they collaborate on a diptych series. And that's always a, a wonderful way to inspire community and, and to, uh, to work together. Um, I don't have people's names up, so I don't, I don't know <laughs> the, uh, the other photographers. Um, uh, but this image I, I particularly liked because of the, you know, aside from the hand, Simon, just to say, if you hit the letter I. Aha, wonderful. Okay, so this one's from Serena Wilkins. Thank you, Serena. Um, I chose this photograph because the, the only thing that connects them is the, the, uh, the lower portion of the image with the hand. And there's a lot in the, um, in the atmosphere of this, you know, the focus on the hand on the left is out, the focus on the hand on the right is in. The, um, the balance of the two images isn't quite right but because the hand you know ties them together perfectly it, it doesn't matter so we can read a lot into um you know the scene of the sea the scene of the road because we know about the context they were they were spoken about we you know we're looking at the sea first we're seeing the adventure the freedom and then we're looking to the right and we're seeing a more enclosed space you know you can read into it there's more there's more shadow on the hand the hands indoors whereas on the left everything's outdoors everything's free uh so i think the balance of these two is really great i think that it's with this image, it's really interesting that it's such a small detail, that it's such a tiny fraction of, this, of, the, um, of the frame that needs to be the same in order for the whole image to work. So even, you know, even if it was just a corner or a, or a small dot or something that, that gave that balance, you can, you can you know, work with very subtle ideas and, and have the rest of the image uh, speak for itself. Uh, this was, one's by the way, just so you know, that was the Alaskan Seas and Black Horse Road, just down the oh. road from me. <laughs> Oh, nice. Cool. Uh, this one, again, I think this one was quite a subtle comp composition or a subtle balance because you've got the, you know, the arch of the bridge on the right and the curve of the, the flower on the left. But because they've been positioned, you know, perfectly, perfectly in line, you know, the balance is there where nothing else needs to be. I thought this was a really interesting, um, really interesting interpretation as well, because you've got you know, you've got the nature, you've got the water, you've got the leaves, you've got the reflection. The, the, the scene could have been taken within five minutes of each other, but because of the balance of the individual images, they work really nicely together as a pair. This one I, I thought was pretty neat. Um, uh, the one on the left is from, as far as I remember, the photography that, uh, is it Jane Hobson? Yeah, the photography that Jane does normally of, of dances with a lot of motion, and then the one on the, on the right, which is kind of whimsical and uh, kind of draws the connection between um, uh, between the dancer and the, and the form of the dancer because I think a lot of dance photography is normally about form and shape um, and we found that form and shape in quite a humorous way. I think if I was going to um, I think to, to take this 
concept to the next level, it would, it would be a matter of tweaking the image on the right, retaking that and maybe adding a little bit of motion um, using a long exposure, uh, you know, turning the, uh, uh, the bottle opener just a little bit as you take the exposure so that they're both blurred so that it takes a little bit more kind of reading into uh, to understand what's going on. And I think, I think that would make it quite a nice scene in general, but as, as, a, as a pair of two images, I, I think it's quite decent. Um, this one I thought was pretty interesting because there's something in the... Um... Just pause for, for one second, Simon. Um, just a comment from Philip saying that the images aren't changing. Um, um, just uh, you know, other participants, can you just let us know if, if they are changing for you? Are they changing for you, Robin? They are for me, yes. Interesting. It could be an internet thing. I'll, I'll wait for that to be resolved then. <laughs> I'll just see. Yeah, it seems to be fine for everyone else. So, Philip, you probably just need uh, to log out okay. and log, log back in, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, for this image, I thought it was quite interesting the way that we've got the image on the left, which is the, you know, the, the context, the detail of the, of the shadow of the trees, but you've also got the, the kind of defect or, um, or detail about the, the lens flare that's gone right through the center. And on the, on the right, you've got the more intentional composition taken quite quickly um, with, the, you know, with the gap between the legs, but it's that still, it's that same vibrant light. And again, this, um, you know, it's a, subtle, it's a subtle detail that's mirrored between the images, but it, it ties them both together. And it, it, it means that you're having to, th to think about, you know, whether it, I don't think it was intentional because I, think, I don't think either of these images were shot specifically for the assignment. But when you look at the way that the composition was used, it could tell you something a bit more about the way that photographers' eyes sees. If they're finding this kind of balance in the images themselves, uh, that can be quite a, a strong learning tool if you're, if you're looking at your own work through diptychs. Um, having said that, I think that the, you know, the, the sweep of the cape, the sweep of the shadows, the, the kind of diagonal leading through that is, is, a, is a great balancing factor as well. I think that's gonna be the, the main the main idea I'll be talking about is whether or not the image is balanced. That's what that's what's most important to me when taking an image, and that's what's most important to me when when pairing images in sequence is whether or not there's enough in each to justify the other. You know, an image can stand on itself, but it, if we're talking about two images together, then it's not enough for these images to stand by themselves. I think a lot of the images submitted are very good individual images, but the the ones that were the strongest diptychs are the ones where there's that balance. It's not just about the strength of each individual image on its own. Um, I was, uh, the, the presentation of this diptych, they, they've used a, um, you know, something with, with corners and borders, which I think, you know, it, it's quite a nitpick, but it's, it's, it's a separating factor. You know, they've, they've decided to, sh to put the corners on each image, which means that there's less of a flow between them. I think when you look at an image like this, where there's, you know, there's, very, there's almost no divide between them, or this one where it's very clear that there are two images in the same frame, whereas on this one, there are two images in individual frames, which makes it less, you know, there's less parity, there's less, um, there's less to show that these images are being presented together, which is, you know, maybe slightly annoying for me, but I think the presentation is important, um, which is why when I uh, supplied the template, it was a very, very simple, very simple one where it's just two images next to each other. Uh, this photograph is another one by Andrew Blowers, who was uh, part of the, the conversational diptych in the first image. This was quite an interesting one. The first one, um, you know, the, the, the balancing factor here is the line. Um, and you've almost got the, a similar, a shared kind of cross with the, the line that goes through the legs on the bottom image and the line of, the, of, of where the people are sitting on the top one. But that's more subtle. Um, as far as I remember, the bottom image is... A, a two meter ruler, um, which is a uh, you know a reference to the current uh, pandemic situation where we where there's uh, you know an enforcement of social distancing of two meters, and this was shot with um, with someone who was using the the two meter stick to measure out the two meters between them and, and the people they were talking to, whereas the top image is a you know a very crowded a very a very stacked overflowing of people. So I think this image works, but you need to know the context of the second image for it to, for, for, in order to understand the way that the, the crowd 
and the, the the space of the second image kind of kind of relate and speak to each other in that he's highlighting a, a difference between these two scenes while also using the compositional similarities of the of the central middle line. Um, this one is by is it Serena or Renee? I've got two names on screen. Anyway, it's a, it's a similar one to the uh, to the one featuring the boat and the hand, where you've got two you know landscape vistas, whereas the top one is one where is is the landscape of today, and the bottom one is a, is a more travel and more optimistic. You know, it features uh, Serena. people. Serena, cool, thank you. Um, you know, the 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 second one has life and has you know the energy of the train motion, the balance of you know a very thin amount of of fraction showing the people and a very wide amount showing the vista whereas the the top one has no life but it's 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 that home life you know it's it you you've got the fact that they that they are you know indoors you've got the the foliage you know keeping the keeping the subject of the houses hidden whereas on the bottom the foliage is the subject i thought that was an interesting um I thought that was an interesting balance, but I think for this one as a diptych, I don't know that there's enough going on in terms of, you know, a relation between the images. I've got the, you know, we've got the, the figure on the right on the top image of the man and the, and the characters leaning out of the train on the left, but because they are on opposite corners, it's, it's much harder to make out, you know, with, with the compositions of each of these images, the, the view is drawn to the center, which means that I think any connecting factor of these images would have to be the center, but because they're, you know, opposite ends of the frame, I don't know that there's enough balance to show what's connecting these images. We've got the, you know, there's, there's a very dark patch over here on the top left, and that should be relating to something here. I think maybe if this frame was flipped and there was emptiness and the people were all on the same side, it would, it would kind of have a nicer balance, uh, but maybe that's just for me. This photograph, I remember being. Um, I thought this was quite an interesting one because of the the uh, the idea of the orchestra and the orchestra coming together in both of the images. You've got the um, the reeds in the bottom image, um, which is you know normally a, a, an aspect of the of like a woodwind instrument. Um, you you would use a reed for the uh, for the mouthpiece, as far as I remember from primary school music class um, and then on the on the top image you've got the strings prominently but it's the coming together of you know the two different types of orchestra it can make you think of the uh, you know the sounds of the orchestra but also the sounds of nature you know the sounds of the leaves rustling themselves whether you've got a more organic you know an organic sound or or, or an artificial sound um, I also quite like the compositionally you know it's all leaning to the right it's all all of the all of the reeds, all of the strings, you can see on the on the lower frame the wind is blowing, you know, left to right across the frame. And that's you know, that's it's good balance essentially. It's 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 a good flow from one image to the next that shows that it's the same image, you know? It there's no um, you know, if, if the leaves were blowing to the left, there would be a bit more tension, there would be more it would be more difficult to understand why the two images are there, but because it's a harmonious image, it's a more harmonious orchestra. Um, this one, oh, another one by Serena. Interesting. Uh, I thought this one was interesting because of the, you know, this one has has again a much clearer focal point in that that you've got the food cart on the on the left hand side of the frame. You've got the people. I think that if this one, if this one shows a more recent image on the on the bottom and the more and the top one is, um, was taken earlier, then you've got the you've got the contrast between the, you know, the city and the urban, you've got the contrast between the crowds of the city and the, you know, the more sparse urban. I think if the, if the second image was taken specifically with the assignment in mind and knowing that it's replying to the first one, I would have gone for an emptier scene. I would have waited for the food truck to maybe be deserted or for there to be fewer, you know, for, for there to be maybe a single character rather than more, because it's not that obvious. Um, the way that there's that there's a reply in this image it feels like it's more of a similar scene found in two different places than something indicative of 
you know, representing the crowd or representing the food cart or representing the space. I don't think it does any of those strongly. I think that you'd have to have something specifically different about the second one in order for it to be a reply to the first. Um, I quite like this one from John, uh, where it's a, you know, a very nicely balanced scene again. Um, I'm sorry that I keep using the word balance. I should, I should try and think of some other words to use. But that's, you know, it's the simplest way to describe what's going on. You've got the, the line of the of the the top image continues almost exactly to the second frame, and I think for this one the the presentation, um, I'm not sure if they used the template or not, but I would have squeezed these two images together so that it was completely, you know, so there was no gap between them whatsoever. That way you've got the continuation. You have to look for the edge of the frame because there's enough in the grey of the curtains, the grey of the window, to um. To feel to feel as if they're the same environment, whereas the top, the middle, you know, with the orange light, the fluorescent, and the and the the silhouette of the face is is different enough that you're seeing the difference there. But the the rest of the frame blends into one. So for the presentation of this one, I, I would have squeezed them together. Um, this one I thought was a great call and response from Simon Revington. I think that this was a great characterizing detail in that you've got the character you've got him and then you've got the hat the hat's a bit dusty you've got the piano it makes you think of the music um you know you've got the outstretched hand as if he's reaching for the piano reaching for the hat i think that there's a really great conversation between these two images happening um compositionally however it's not a good aesthetic example because the i think the hat overshadows the man and because the man's behind glass you're not getting enough um in terms of the, the tonality of the image, the, the deep rich blacks on the right, they're a lot more washed out, it's a lot more gray on the left. So I would have either played with the contrast on the left so that the colors were a little bit more matched. Um, having said that, you know, the fact that they're both orange tinted, you've got good, you know, the, the color makes sense where it's the orange, but it's not where it's the black, which, which kind of fades the man out a little bit. I would have worked um, maybe even just slight tweaks on the edit of each image individually first to bring them to more of a parity before pairing them. Because um, once, you've, once you've made a diptych and it's one single file, one single image, then any adjustments you're making are global across, across both. Whereas doing individual tweaks to them before thinking of them as a diptych or having in mind that they'll be a diptych but making the changes individually is a, is a better workflow. Uh, for processing specifically with the intent of producing a diptych. Um, this one was an interesting one. I think in terms of the concept of these images where you've got the two vehicles, you, you know, you've got the detail of the one vehicle. I can't tell if, is the one on the left a car or is that the same boat? I don't know what boats look like up close. <laughs> um, Rob, if you're in the if you're in the chat, please let us know. Um, but I think that because it, it's an example of of one where because the one on the left and the one on the right are so different, you have to properly investigate and look into why you know why they're being presented as the same. Because if they're the same vehicle in two different situations, an RV. Thank you guys. <laughs> Shows how much I know about vehicles, camper van or RV. Cool. So, so yeah, having to figure out the one on the left threw me a little bit because if they were both black and white, then I would just assume that the that the diptych is about vehicles, about travel, about um, you know motion. Whereas because the one on the left is in color, I'm left a little bit having to wonder why it's in color. So, you know, it, it, the image as an individual image isn't really about the orange of the light, the orange of the sign in the background. It's not really about any of the writing going on so it's just a detail of this camper van and because of that I don't think I don't think it's as effective in saying whatever whatever Rob's trying to say here because I think if it's about if it's about the motion of of, of a boat on water for example then maybe a close-up of the boat in water similar to the one on the left but instead of being a camper van on the street it would be a boat in water so you would have a little bit of the water maybe leading up to the uh maybe leading up to the shadow of the boat on the right and then you would see you know the the front is that the bow is that the bow of the ship i think so <laughs> you would see that 
and then um and then you, you the rest of it would be the the shot of the boat and then you would see the boat in action i also think what's quite interesting for this one is that you've got the boat moving from right to left on the frame um normally again i for motion in the frame i try and go left to right myself so you know if you invert this image and it changes the meaning then that's one thing but i don't think it especially would whereas if you were to flip the image and have the boat leading from left to right you would have more a better compositional balance because you would have the slope of the rv and the slope of the boat moving in one direction um but the but because they're both moving towards the center i think it's it's a bit you know it's a little bit more um conflicting and it's it's a difficult image to to justify uh, as a diptych sorry for this photograph by miguel i think this was um I think this was a was an excellent response to what the brief was originally going to be, which is something I mentioned during the Q and A session. I think you you very clearly got the um, you know the roped up bench, which I think in in many countries happened because of the pandemic to prevent people from sitting together. Um, and you've got the you know the few people in the background; they're quite distant. The image is a little bit darker as well. The image on the bottom, the uh, the banner's been ripped, not the banner, the ribbon, the the warning label's been ripped. You've got more people in the back. They're, you know, they're, they're a family. There's a pram. Uh, they're in, they're in more summery clothing, whereas on the top they're in wintry clothing. I think there's a lot of details in each of these where you can really look at them and see, you know, the passage of time. The um, the image on the bottom is slightly brighter. So if they were exposed the same way, maybe, um, you know, you're really seeing that summer light coming through in the brighter image. Uh, the fact that the composition is identical but the passage of time has happened is is fantastic you know you've even got the the grass grown um on the bottom there's there's so many details in this that that show the transition from one image to the next i think it's i think it's really great um this is another one by miguel and i think this one um again in terms of the content in terms of the context you've got the You've got the role of the, the, the circular, you know, the, the oval shape of the open bottle and of the washing machine, um, both of which are open, both of which are facing the same way. So that's enough just to have that small amount of mirroring, similar to the, uh, to the way that the hand tied everything together in Serena's first one. Just having that very simple shape just is, is an instant connection between them, which means that everything else, the, the pills, the legs, um, you know the depth of field they're two very 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 different images but you really can read a lot into what's being said with you know the fact that the person on the right is hiding what the pills could represent um i think there's quite a, a strong semiotic to uh to having a you know a jar of upended pills that can mean lots of things to lots of people i think if, if you were going to be really technical you know you could look at what exactly they are um on the label but that would be probably going too far because then you'd have to draw some kind of connection between what that says and what it says on the washing machine which is you know you can take these things too far um but yeah in terms of the simplicity of the way that these images are connected i think is i think is pretty cool um this one again is another one where you've got a um a balance between uh, you know, you've got a passage of time, you've got a, a, a present image, image and a missing image, you've got a detail. Um, so on the left, you've got the candle, which is out of focus. On the right, you've got the candles, which are in focus, but much later because they've been used. Um, you know, you've got the, is it a, is it a Victoria sponge? Nice. <laughs> you've got the Victoria sponge, which is absent. Um, and I, I think it shows, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's just a, it's a tea time well had, you know, the, the cake's gone, the candles have burnt down. Um, I thought it was interesting that the lighting is, is fairly consistent between them as if they were taken at the same time of day. I think that for this image, it would be more interesting to have, you know, one on the left be the neutral kind of warm tones of daylight and on the right be a more orange hue or a bluer hue to show that, you know, the, the lighting's changed, it's artificial, it's later at night. Um, I think that's a better way, you know, the, the, the showing the candles burned down is a very classic way to show passage of time. But having the lighting change to reflect that as well, I think, would make a, a much more interesting set, um, a more interesting sequence of images. Um, this one I thought was interesting because, again, they're very, very different. The, the, the compositions of them, you know, they're, they're very clearly not 
composed with the same thing in mind, but the content of the image, the, the realness of the person on the left, the statuesque on the right, the, um, the color black and white. This is another one where I think the, um, the reading isn't supposed to happen left to right or right to left, but they're supposed to be a balance. And I think it works better in this one because the heads are moving out on, on the same plane, almost, you know, the line can, you can draw a line here and it's basically the same level rather than having something here and something here, which is a, a bit harder to see. Um, in terms of presentation, the borders are a bit odd. Um, but again, that's, that's just a nitpick, but I think it's, it's better just to show both of these as, as one with, it, with as little separating them as possible. I also think that compositionally, there's a lot of negative space on the right here and on the right here. And I think that if you're gonna work with images that are like these as a diptych, just to make them both square format, would, would make a lot of sense because then you see one rectangular images, the balance is there. You're not kind of let off screen in any way. Your focus is kept to the most important aspects, which is the, the central figures. And I think that's the last one of my selection. So if we want to move to the Q&A session now, if that's all right, if Q and A's have been coming in, well, Q's and then the A's are later. <laughs> Yeah, so please, yeah, any questions, please write them in now. Cool. Yeah, that was course. the last one. There's that one. Someone, yeah, just asking again. It is, it is, of course, being recorded as always, and I'll be sending a, a link to download that afterwards. Cool. Should we give that five minutes then for those to come in? Yeah. Um, and if there are any critiques that anyone wanted to have, not on work that isn't here, but thought there was something I kind of overlooked because this was an odd, um, as I was saying to Robin earlier, this was an odd one to critique because it's about the, it's not about the worth of individual images. It's about um, the, the way that two images work as one. So I'm trying to talk as much about, the, the only things I can really cover are whether they work together in terms of black and white and color, whether they work together in terms of balance of composition and whether or not the presentation is all right. Anything further than that would be to talk about the individual images individually, not as sets. I've assumed that every set that I've received has been well considered and well thought out and that I'm looking at what the artist intended for me to see. Um, I see James asked to see them all in one image, in one Just, screen. Yeah, if I you will do... command A and then um, pre press the letter N. Cool. And you can shift Some... tab and close your tabs. Wonderful. And again, because it's being recorded, you can go back and view them individually. Or if you look, I've seen already on the, on the hashtag, a few people have been sharing them, which is nice. So you can offer you know, any feedback or critique yourselves to each other there. Um, the QR box then. And actually, as we are waiting for some questions, it's, it's worth me just plugging your um, portfolio review day, which is happening on the 28th, I think it is, Sunday the 28th. There's That's still right. a few slots left available. Um, and Simon will be offering um, 45 minute 40 slot. Minutes. Is it 40 minutes? 40, 40 minute minutes slots. Um, so yeah, you, those are bookable via the, the Leica website. Same yeah. area where you would have signed up for this workshop. And for what I'm expecting for that will be, um, you know, either full projects or full portfolios where the justification of the images will matter. The justification of um, things like direction, style, approach will be covering um, uh, maybe a little bit of post-processing if that's something people have specific questions about, but it's more to do with the curation of a body of work, the curation of ideas, the curation of a direction, becoming far more considered about um, what photography really means to you, you know, how, how you want to go about photography, which I think is different to the way portfolio review sessions normally work, which is, you know, looking at the work for the sake of the work rather than looking at the work for the sake of the photographer. Um, do we have any more questions specifically to this one, though? No, I don't think so. Is it possibly worth um, if I could share the, the the other submissions and just flick through some of those? Sure. As we're waiting, um, I can do that. You can do that. Cool. Yeah. One second. In terms of um, so so you'll share your screen, yes. rather. Cool. Like so, is that working? interesting? Weird. That's okay. I can see. <laughs> I'm viewing your screen. Is everyone else able to see this as well? Yep. Cool. 
Um, so I can just I fl flick through some of these. Sure. This one was an interesting one. Yeah, the the color balance again because of those, uh, you know, the 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 boldness, the primariness of the colors. They don't need to be connected in any other way other than some kind of semiotic connection, some kind of semiotic understanding of two ideas. You know, both street photos, I assume, but the the, the boldness of the red, the boldness of the blue. That's that's all that matters for them to for them to make sense as a diptych. It's a question that um, Steve's just saying. I often like diptychs or book spread that jar against each other and are not sympathetic to each other. I can't quantify this. If it's too obvious, I lose interest. Yes. I so I think that tension and conflict are great. They're great in individual images. They're great in diptychs. Um, but I think it's a it's a it's a harder it's a more difficult thing to do to produce a diptych which has conflict between both images without it looking without it just being a mess without it not making sense you know coherently conceptually i think that for the sake of the assignment it made sense to um to have people look in terms of best you know best balance as much as possible whereas for sure for you know to, to take it further to find images which might um work aesthetically together but not uh conceptually or work conceptually but not aesthetically but as long as there's something that ties them together it, for that connection to happen i think that that makes it mo the most effective thing i think if you go back through the um the presentation yesterday and take each of those bullet points any any of those bullet points so the idea of contextualization and characterization for example as long as one of those things is there then you can play around with the other one but i think at least one of those ideas should be present for it to be effective to an audience to be able to read it rather than ignoring all of them um yeah i think that makes sense are we still viewing your screen robin yep I just had a bit of an accident there, but I think I'm back on track. That's right, cool. Um, this image I thought was interesting. There's, um, you know, the two different times of day, the building. I just think that, you know, maybe a slight tweak, a slight adjustment on the, um, on the, the levelness of either the top or bottom images just to bring the lines together. Otherwise, you've got the lines leading. I think they lead too far, which means that the image is unbalanced. Um, but I think a little bit of balance, a little bit more concentration on the central subject of the bottom image, um, you know, would, would bring these two far close together conceptually. Um, I think is is the I think the either one or both of these images is a double exposure, which isn't something I've played around much with, but I think that could be an interesting one to move through. Um, a diptych which is made of double exposure so that it's four images as one rather than just uh, rather than just two individually shot images as one. Um, I don't know that these especially work as a diptych but I think it was a fascinating concept to see that it, it was something I hadn't considered essentially that, that you could use double exposures but I haven't I haven't got much of a, a double exposure workflow or body of work yet um, but it's definitely something I'll be thinking about after seeing this one. Actually, and I've just seen in the comments, Bruin is doing a, a blog post about diptychs. So okay. yeah, that's absolutely fine to ask. Please, you know, feel free to submit. What was the question, sorry? Um, uh, Bruin is just asking if any of the other participants on the call would like to have their work featured on her blog post. Oh, I'm sure um, if she reaches out to people who have shared it on social media and to any of the others she can find, um, or does she want to share her maybe Instagram in the in the chat box and then people can share to her? She, she shared she shared her um, oh, cool. email address. Cool. Uh, I've seen Laurie's asked a question. Um, narrative of two images translating to five. So the way I use five images is for sequencing a much larger body of work. So if I've got you know fifty to one hundred images and they need to flow from page one to page 50 or to page 100 it's it's very difficult to maintain a um 
if, if you think of if you think of uh, viewing a book the same way as a, as like a watching a show or watching a movie you you there needs to be a similar kind of roller coaster of introduce an idea do something with that idea bring the audience up put the audience down and then leave them with a resolution or leave them with wanting more and i think that for if you're if you're producing images of five that's a very it's a very easy number to to do all of those things in before leading on to the next one whereas if you do it with 10 by the time you've reached the 10 image you've already forgotten what the hook was of the first image so having five images which then lead into the next five and the next five is a, is an easy way to do it and it's an easy way for an audience to consume it for translating two images into five if i produce one diptych i can look at the way i can use the second image of that diptych to lead into another one so that it becomes all, so that it becomes a flow of three images and then a flow of four and then i try and have the fifth image be a different enough that it can introduce the next concept or conclude the previous concept but it's still that that's a that's for sequencing much larger bodies of work whereas a diptych can be its own aesthetic thing of just two images presented together so for the purposes of the webinar that's what i was talking about but if you want to talk about sequencing much larger bodies of work then a diptych is a useful tool but it's not the only thing that can be used but it's a useful thing that i use sorry that was a bit rambly um no, but hopefully right. useful i'm just continuing to flick through some of the submissions as you talk yeah. Like I said, the, the vast majority of the submissions we received were, were wonderfully aesthetic images. Um, I think in terms of some, some of them, I think were presented a bit oddly because they've, you know, they've stretched one image to meet the parameters of the other. I think like this one, the, the image on the right has been kind of compressed. I think it's fine for, it not to, for them not to be balanced physically. You know, the, the image on the right could be stretched out to its full size. Um, but I think people were maybe a little bit confused because of the way I presented my own. Stress like, out as in um, a different ratio to the one on the left. I don't know about ratio, but I think it's been, it's been squeezed. Ah, you, know? I see. you can see it's been, it's been squeezed in. So I think just allowing it to, ha allowing it to, be, its, to be the image that it is, all that it needs to be for the diptych is for them to be next to each other and positioned, and then you can read into it. Whereas I think for a few of them, because they were squeezed and compressed oddly, there was an odd, um, it, it was an, it was an odd one to to try and process, which means it was a, uh, it wasn't, it would, it, they weren't ones I included for the for the presentation. This one's an interesting one. I, I think this is the one we had a question about, where it was about the vintage photograph in a more modern setting. Um, I think the execution of this one is great because of the overlap. You know, you, it's it's almost that um, that kind of internet. Uh, thing where people revisit historical locations with a with a famous photograph and re and you know overlay it, um, but I think the execution of this particular one, you know, the, if you want to match something up, whether it's the chair or the wallpaper, you'll have to check play around with the size, either the size of the image on the left so that the wallpaper is the same size, or move the chair a little bit so that the chair is in a is in a better position. Um, but other than that, I think the the, the concept is really great. Um, it's just the execution, you know, a few tweaks and it would be, it would be just right. So as you say, you can apply a lot of your critique to a, a lot of the images, I think. Yeah. It, it, the, the the important things are that you that you review the the list of topics that I said about what a diptych can do during the the original presentation, and then figure out which of those things you want to do before you do it, rather than just smashing images together. Which means that because I assume that none of these images were just smashed together, they were considering the function of those things. Which means that they're either effective at doing those things or not. And the effectiveness of that will be down to essentially the flow of the images, whether they flow conceptually or, or um, relating to a character or to do with the, the composition or the aesthetic or the colors or the direction of a, of a, of a motion. 
you know. And just um, on colors, there's a question there from um, Laurie, just saying any tips on pulling across use of color to tie together between images? Yes, so I think that um, in terms of color matching or color theory, which is, a, you know, that's it, its own art concept, um, When it comes to black and white images, you're looking at simplicity, you're looking at no color, which means that a more conceptual or compositional based um, connection is required. When you look at connecting two color images or a color image to black and white, the, yeah, so as in this image, either the, you know, the red stands out, so you need either a color that pulls it together, a sequence of colors that pulls it together, or between the two images, the colors need to balance. I think there's a, um, there's an online color wheel, which I think is run by Adobe, and you can click on the color wheel and it will give you the complementary colors to that color. And that's quite a good way of learning what balances with what. So if on the left, you've got a color which balances with a color on the image on the right, that's fine. But if you've got, if you've got you know, a clash of colors, then that can be a bit too distracting. Um, so either the same color or a color that complements that color to be used across the two different frames. And then if the prominent image or the important image is black and white, then like in this image, this is great timing by the way, Robin, <laughs> like in this image, the pattern or the composition or the aesthetic of the image matters more than the color. But that's when the prominent image is black and white because in black and white, you, unless there's one bold singular color in the other image, what you want to be matching up is the way the images look in terms of the shapes and the geometry and the and the movement across the frame rather than a color. I thought this one was an interesting one. It's got the, um, it's almost as if it's divided into three, but it's not. Um, the, the issue I had with this image is that I don't think there's enough of the connective tissue between the image on the right, which is black and white with no motor vehicles and the one on the left. I think you, it's a real stretch to find a real connection between these two. I think that in terms of the black and white working with the color image, there isn't enough. It, the diptych isn't about the black and white and the color or the content of the image on the right or the content of the image on the left, which means that it's just an aesthetic image of you know the, the three lines which is nice but I think that could be achieved with any third image that you could add to this set um, I don't think that these are the most effective images to, to be used together which, which is it's entirely possible that this you know is it Rob that that to Rob this means something that it doesn't mean to me um, but I don't think that just providing this image with explanatory text would be the solution. I think that having a stronger, a stronger interpretation of, of the idea that he's trying to convey in each image would be, would be the answer. I think this one and the next one are two images that were submitted separately. Um, to be together, yeah. Yeah, you have to like switch between them very quickly. <laughs> um, and again, yeah, conceptually, you've got the open window with the rain, the closed window with the flowers, the the foliage on the outside, the foliage on the inside. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the first webinar I did, which was through my window. Um, and I, I, I just think as a diptych, you know, if if there's a concept, you can take it further. If it's if it's about the window, then you've got the window closed and then the, the droplets on the glass but you'd have to move a lot closer if it's about the foliage and the focus we need to be on the foliage rather than the rain so figuring out which one thing it should be one thing at a time you want to connect with these images and then if you find another layer and another layer but starting with one very prominent aspect and then building on that makes it just makes it that much more powerful when viewed as the whole Yeah, Stephen's submissions were interesting because I think they are very strong individual images, but the but the framing was just 
did not make me think that it was a, a diptych presentation. It was more like it was a submission of individual images, which, you know, it, it's such a small detail, but it was, it, it took me out of it that much more that it was difficult to, to comment on the specifics yeah. of, of them as two images rather than as, as individual images. This one was a neat concept with the, uh, you know, the cigarette being the grounded, you know, the grounded aspect. Um, I think that if you're going to produce, if you're, if you're going to work on an image like this where it's about details or about a shared concept, then because of the image on the left has a lot of, you know, the, there's a lot of fall off with the, with the background. I think you could easily crop that image so that it's just the character of the nun, or I assume it's supposed to be some kind of nun outfit <laughs> um, smoking, the, smoking the cigarette, and it would just be about them. Because there's so much empty space, it feels a lot less, you know, there's a lot less balance. You can have two different images with two different aspect ratios working together. So you can just crop all of that unnecessary, uh, all of that Bokka out. Sorry to the, to the Bokka fans. Um, but that can, be, that can be lost quite easily in this image, I think, which means that it would just be about the three characters in two images. I think there, were, there was one image, uh, I think possibly by the same photographer who did an image with the flowers in colour and one in black and white. Are we able to find that one? Um, let's have a look. By which same photographer, sorry? By the, one, the one you showed a couple of frames ago where it was the two flowers, this one. This one, Teresa. Teresa. Do we have that or did I I think I it would, yeah, it would have come up in the order. If not, that's all right. Well, I'll just flip back now. So yeah, last, last chance for any further questions. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a shorter session today, but I think it's been- Really interesting. It's, it's mostly made sense across, across all of them. You know, I, I, think that's, I think that's true of most critique I, I, uh, I've been giving for these, uh, for these webinars is that the, the points were, which are strong are strong for most of the submissions, the point which are weak are weak. Um, usually conceptually uh but you know it's, it's a very tightly time limited uh webinar that we're offering i'm sure with more time and practice you know these early examples which are good can become much much better um i'm, I'm pretty happy that i've no i don't think we've ever received a truly terrible submission no it was, um, it was great to get such a you know vast array and, and actually so many submissions for this so yeah. yeah thank you all for joining in and getting involved in the spirit Okay, I think we'll end it there. Cool, so wonderful. Th thank, you. thank you very much, Simon. Really interesting as always. And I will be, as always, sending that email shortly after this with a, a link to download a recording of the session. So you can always refer back to it. And I'll also, I'll put in the, the link to um, Simon's Portfolio Review Day, which is happening on Sunday the 28th. Um, but yes, have a good weekend, everybody. And hopefully see you on further webinars in the future.